Good day, folks. This is Greg Judy at Green Pastures Farm. Today's topic, and I had a question. Uh, it was a good one from a fellow, and uh, he said, Greg, he said, I've been working on a farm, trying to get you know, pasture established. He said, I really don't know what good pasture looks like. And uh, he said, it would be immensely helpful if you would do a, you know, just a video and covering that topic, what, you know, good pasture looks like and, and the plants that you're looking for and the management behind that um so we're standing here in a pasture that was uh this was actually grazed off with the cow mob when i say cow mob there was uh uh 350 animals probably 100 160 mama cows uh 30 40 uh, heifers and about 100 yearlings and 20 30 steers and what was it uh, about 80 85 uh, baby calves so uh, they were here eight days ago now you look at this there's a lot of seed heads the fescue's coming on pretty strong but if you look down real close i call this pretty good pasture there's not a lot of bare ground out here uh, you can see the plants are still well, right here see that they're, they're chewed off on the end they're not completely grown back yet but they were only grazed off eight days ago and uh so there's still a lot of there's a lot of uh, forage in here, but see, I've got a, a splattering of clover. You don't want to have a pure stand of clover, but you're going to have areas around your pasture where you have, uh, oh, right here, right here beside me on the left. Okay, now here's an area that's got just pretty much all clover. Don't, don't worry about that. There's nothing to sweat about. You're never going to have it exactly perfect, but what you're looking for is you're walking through your field is you don't want a solid stand of grass. You want to see some clover. Uh, here's some ironweed right here. So what? There's this, it's another diversity, okay? Uh, here's where the cattle graze this pretty short right there. But it's coming back nicely. Here's a, a blackberry. There's a blackberry plant, okay? It's getting ready to put on blackberries. We can come out here for a pasture walk this summer and pick... A handful of blackberries right here in the middle of our field so don't get too you know if the whole field goes to blackberries that's a different deal you've got to do something about that but uh look for diversity in your pasture you don't want a solid stand of anything so here we are we're walking through more clover there's there's red clover here okay and down in the lower canopy there there's some white clover of course we have fescue uh there's orchard grass <coughs> um there's a little bit of brome in here. The small, the small plant right here with the small seed head, right there. That's bluegrass. So I've got, uh, just in view right here, I've got like five different species that I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy with. Oh, over here. Now here's one you got to kind of keep an eye on. I'm gonna get this one. This is a gnarly looking thing. Okay. I don't want that growing. It's got some really mean thorns on it. Um, that's going to... I don't want that thing propagating. So I'm going to take care. I didn't even know that was in here. But even though it's as mean as it is, you notice the ends of those leaves have been plucked off by a cow tongue. But it is a mean little brother. It's going to get bigger. And it might throw out some seed and I'll have a whole bunch of that. And that's not a honey locust. I'm not sure what that one is. It's a mean one. It snuck up on me, I can tell you that. So now here's another area. Uh, there's more clover than I like, but you know what? What are you going to do about it? It will fix itself. Just don't worry about it. Don't lose any sleep over it. Just go on. Here's the white clover now just starting to put on seed and blooms and... Uh, Jan and Brenda, the, the beekeepers, my wife Jan and her girlfriend uh, Brenda, uh, there's a red clover seed right there. Uh, they've got bees, and so the bees are going to have a heyday out here with all these blossoms. And they just captured uh, two more swarms this is last week, and they, they put out a bunch of swarm boxes early spring. And of all things, those boxes have got two more swarms in them, so they're going to... In a period of about three weeks, 
they've actually captured four hives of bees. They got four hives, and they're gonna, when they get the other two out, they're gonna have four hives. It's pretty cool. We got a lot of stuff out here to feed them. It's gonna be a lot of blossoms, but so good pasture, you know, if it gets mature on you like this, and you don't have enough animals to eat it, I'm probably gonna come in here uh, behind the cattle. I may let them graze this when we come back first, so I won't be clipping this off for another and we won't be back, be back here for probably uh, 35, 40 days. And this is uh, May 20th. It was, uh, well, actually yesterday, folks, it was Jan and mine uh, 20th wedding anniversary. And I uh, took Jan out for dinner last night. And we it was kind of neat. We, we got home and she pulled out our, she made a scrapbook out of our wedding day pictures. And that was kind of neat, going back and looking at Jan in her wedding dress and me and my tux and all the family members and how young everybody was in those days. And our nieces were little baby girls, and today they're grown up and they're in college and graduating college. And it was just neat. It was neat to look look over all that. So, yeah, it brings back great, great memories. And, of course, some of the people in those pictures, my dad and my mom, have since passed. And uh, that's that's life, you know. It's generation to the next, and uh, but yeah, it was it was awesome reminiscing with my beautiful bride, and we had a we had a great evening doing that. But uh, back to this pasture. What makes a good pasture? Sorry, I got off on that tangent, but uh, yeah, that was kind of neat. The the orchard grass right here, we've got quite a bit of that. Uh, there's a there's some shade i like to have a little shade around my pasture if i can there's a great big hickory tree and somebody asked and i had a question in our last rotation while we had that fenced off they didn't need to be underneath there it wasn't hot and that's something you want to focus on folks early in the spring and early summer if you've got a really nice tree like that don't let them underneath there put a wire around it around the drip edge don't let them under that tree because that tree is going to see some fertilizer this summer when they need it. You don't need to be plopping manure underneath there and urine in, uh, you know, March, April, and parts of May. They may need that tree the latter part of June, July, August. So that's why we put a wire around it. You can kill a tree like that by putting too much manure underneath it. They've got all that stuff over there if they want to get some shade. They don't need to be going around that tree. What makes a good pasture? Well, you got to have a water source. We've got a new pond down there, and uh, that's the one we're going to put a skirt in. I'm thinking real hard about my YouTubers' comments. A lot of y'all said put it in that spillway. Kind of thinking pretty serious about that. I may, may do that. We're really liking these skirts. I'm telling you, they're cheaper than tire tanks. Um, so you got to, it's nice to have some shade, and if you're a small operation, and you don't have any shade out there, I would even look at getting a, a welder to weld you up a, a sled, a steel sled out of, let's say, inch and a quarter pipe. Put a top cover, like, you know, it looks like a sled. So you've got the, the sleigh part on the ground and the, the beams going up. And then go to a, a landscaping company or a greenhouse and get you some shade cloth, the black shade cloth. And just fasten it on the top. And put a chain on a, a chain on the bottom where you can just hook it on the drawbar of your four-wheeler and drag that shade around. If you've got a small herd, that's very do very doable. Uh, you know, we've got four to five hundred animals out here. It makes it a little tougher for a shade mobile. So we're fortunate. We do have a lot of shade on most of our pastures. But if you're starting out on a farm, you don't have that. Uh, you know. You need, to, you need to figure about that if you're living in an area where it's going to get hot. So what makes a good pasture? you got to have water. Talked about the pond. Uh, there's also pressurized water, which we have right over here. Um, <clears throat> we do have a hydrant. And uh, I'll just walk you over and show you. This is a frost-free hydrant. And when we come into this paddock, uh, we can hook a uh, just a garden hose. Actually, it's not a garden hose. Let me back up on that. If you're going to use pressurized water, make sure you use a hydraulic hose. Go to a hydraulic shop. Tell them you want a six or seven foot piece of it. 
with a garden hose fitting on each end. Okay, and then you can hook it right onto that hydrant. If you don't use a hydraulic hose, it will burst open on a hot day and you're gonna have a big water leak. Uh, I wouldn't do this <clears throat> again for a large herd. This would be fine for 30 to 40 cows. This is my this would be what you call a winter system. Uh, there is that great big culvert underneath there. I think it's 18 inches across. It goes down the ground four foot. And uh, it keeps this thing from freezing. You can tell I haven't used it for a while. It's got mice that stored some hickory nuts in there. But th these aren't bad waters if you're going to do a small herd. It doesn't work with big herds. There's not enough capacity there. Just not enough water. But this concrete's kind of nice to keep them up out of the mud if you're using something like that. Uh, but I just, for a large herd, we just put our hose on that. And then we run a, run it out here in the pasture. So the few places you'll see bare dirt on our farm is around a water point. And that was made this winter when it was really muddy. But, uh, yeah, don't take it all. So if you get your pasture started, don't take it all down. The more you take down, uh, the slower it's going to recut. The slower it's going to be growing back. Folks, this was grazed nine days ago nine days ago look at this i mean we could graze this thing again probably in two weeks look at this orchard grass i mean they nailed that but see we, we left a lot of solar collector there the longer the solar collector you can leave intact the more energy it can collect from the sun the quicker it's going to grow back okay it's just simple rule of dynamics. A bigger, bigger solar collector, more energy. More energy, quicker regrowth. Get in a drought, you're going to wish you had it. Now see, there's an area that didn't graze. And look at the seed heads I've got there. So if I come in here another 45 days behind the cows, as soon as they're taken out of here and I clip that, because they're probably not going to eat that next rotation either, and I throw that seed everywhere, or the cows may just trample it on the ground, and that'll spread it. You get a lot of natural reseeding that way. Uh, we just don't seed anything anymore. Don't need it. Just don't need it. Man, I'm telling you, this is this is good pasture. So this is what good pasture looks like. You got the lagoons, you got the grasses, you got some forbs, uh, you've got a water source. And it's not, don't overcomplicate it. When you get your animals trained to wire, I'll show you, show you the uh, whole investment we have over here in wire. <laughs> it's, it's pretty simple. We can put 400 head in here. And that's, you know, baby calves and everything. Look at this. That's it. Got one 32-inch wire with 8,000 volts in it. And I can hear people saying, but Greg, that's not going to keep a baby calf in. Well, mostly it does. They can go underneath that if they want, but they're going to come back because Mama's over here. Mama's not going to go over there. And uh, on this side of the driveway, we don't even have a fence. This is a poly. So when we, when we graze this, we just run a poly wire along the edge of this driveway. And after Jan's flowers are done, we don't even put a poly in here. We let them graze this, and they can graze this side of the driveway, this little piece. But uh, her, she's got some iris here. And by the way, I love iris. In fact, I've got to stick my nose down in that one. Oh, golly. Huh. Break that old one off. There we go. Um, that's why I love iris. They're beautiful, and the smell. Oh, the smell is just unbelievable. Here's a mulberry tree that came up as a little guy, and I've been pruning it. It's pretty close to the driveway, but it's kind of growing away from the driveway. So that's going to make a pretty good shade tree one of these days. There's some yellow iris coming on. Ooh, look at this one. This is a pink one with a yellow. Oh my, look at that. That throat down in there, they're just beautiful flowers. You got the ruffles on them. 
I think I got my love of flowers from my mom. She loved flowers. And I always used to kid her. I said, Mom, you spend a lot of time in that flower. That was her, that was her way that she relaxed. Mom was a workaholic. But she loved her flowers. I said, well, you can't eat them, Mom. You raise a garden, you can eat that. She goes, well, we have a garden, and we eat it. But she said, you can also eat daylilies. <laughs> or, yeah, you can fry them up when they're a little guy. You chop them off, and you can fry them, and they're actually good to eat. Man, look at that. I'm sorry, guys. I guess, ladies, I got to stick my nose in that one, too. Oh, golly. Mm -mm -mm. Beautiful. But, uh... I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. Uh, this is what uh, good pasture looks like. We've got uh, a nice diversity out here. No monocultures on Judy Farms. And that's the thing I have about haying land. Everybody talks about green chopping. Oh, it's got ahead of you, Greg. Can you go in and green chop that? I'm not going to green chop anything. I don't want to put a machinery out here on this land and compress my soil when it's wet, number one. Number two, you take that off of here, and then you get a drought. Folks, I've done it. Did it in the past. And any time you mow it off and then it doesn't rain, you may end up having to sell 50% of your cow herd because you don't have anything left for them to eat. You had it. You had it out there. Even though it's mature, it doesn't matter. It's still out there. They can eat that. It's better than feeding them hay that you had to go out there and bale them, or even green chop that you had to put up in silage or whatever. So just remember, grazing promotes diversity. Mowing and baling haying land promotes monoculture, single species. So it's a ruminant animal that gives us that advantage. Learn and get the mindset that you need to graze every square inch of your property. And if you do that, you're going to be head and, shoulder, head and shoulders ahead of everybody else that's got this hay mindset. Oh, you got to hay, you got to hay, it's got away from you. You know, I, I could hay this. And I'd get a lot of bales off of it. But then I'm going to have to put something back. And uh, if it doesn't rain, I'm going to have to sell off some animals because I don't need grass. That's just goofy. Anyway, I've carried on enough about that. I hope this helps some of y'all starting out that are just you know, trying to figure out what good pasture looks like. And I think you've seen a good representation of that today. Everyone have a good one. And hit that subscribe button on the way out. And uh, I'm going to be posting our grazing school. Uh, it's going to be uh, the it's going to be a two day school in September, and it's the second um, Thursday and Friday in September. I don't have the calendar with me, or I'd give you that date. But it'll be on our it'll be on our uh, website, greenpasturesfarm.net. So anyway, hit that subscribe button on the way out, and uh, everyone have a great day, and uh, we'll see you next time.